Good evening. I am so happy to see so many people still awake at 5 p.m. after all the stuff that we have done today. My name is Darren Briskman, and I have the honor to be your guide as we go through an introduction to managed database services across the world of Amazon Web Services. So I'll start out by saying with me is the amazing team from FanDuel. And if you don't know what FanDuel is, you'll find out today, as well as them showing us a great example about how you go through these decisions. So I'm going to warn you right now, I'm going to talk really fast. So if you don't understand what I'm saying, like everything else at this conference, it will all be online next week. So managed databases, here's our landscape. We have a wide number of things that we're doing, and they all fall in the managed database world into four broad categories. They're relational databases, or they're big data and integration, or they're NoSQL and memory databases, or they're analytics and search. So this is a boring slide, so let's dive into them in detail. So first, why use a managed database at all? Well, it's the next step in the cloud evolution. Right? Before you used cloud, you had to do everything. So everything from the uh, HVAC, the air conditioning, the rack and stack, up through the operating system, the database, the scaling, whatever. But hey, now we're on EC2. So when you use Amazon Web Services, it's taking care of a big chunk of this for you. So we have automated systems that are taking care of the power, the rack and stack, or the server, or the operating system, or at least the install. And we've got many, many customers who are doing this and are very happy with running databases on EC2. And it's a great solution. It works fine. Works for almost any database, certainly anything that could run on Linux or Windows. But you're still doing a lot of work. In this world, you're still installing the database. You're still patching the database. You're still doing high availability. You're still doing scaling. You're still doing optimization. When you move to a managed service, all you have to worry about is the app. Everything else becomes Amazon's problem. We do it for you. Now, it's interesting to me to watch us having the same conversations now that we used to have six years ago about the cloud. I remember like 10 years ago, people go, why would I want a cloud? And then five years ago, I talked to a lot of our customers who or were not yet our customers who would say things like, well, yeah, but I can do all this. It's not that hard to run a server. And you're right, it's not. It's not that hard to run a database. But it's a suck of time. It's a suck of attention. It means you're doing things that are not what you want to do. What you want to do is do something awesome for your company, for your business, for your industry. Not manage high availability in a database environment. So if you're a database company, that's awesome. If you do anything else, you want someone else to do that so you can focus on what matters. And that's the whole point behind managed databases. So managed databases are an important part of Amazon Web Services. It was one of the things that one of the first services we started offering. It's an increasing part of what our customers are using in order to get the real benefit of the cloud. And you know, across the benefits of cloud, elasticity, agility, global reach, cost reduction, the big one to me, I think, really becomes the agility. The fact that you are able to focus on what you care about, not focus on running systems. However, there's a lot of choices in here, so we're going to walk through what some of them are for a few minutes. So I'm going to start with our oldest of these services, which is our relational database service, Amazon RDS. And RDS is essentially the idea of no, no infrastructure to manage and instant provisioning across multiple engines. So we started with the MySQL engine, and since then we've uh, expanded to numerous other engines. So we have MySQL and, and MariaDB, or MariaDB, depending on who you ask at that organization. Uh, we also have Postgres, PostgresQL. And then we have a couple of commercial offerings, so Oracle or Microsoft SQL Server. All of those run as a fully managed revision environment that we can scale up and down, use different instance types, use different pieces. And then, as many of you may have heard, last year we introduced Aurora. MySQL is a great product, but it has to support every possible piece of infrastructure out there. It needs to run on a laptop, it needs to run on a cluster, it needs to run on everything in between. We don't need to do that. We just need to make it run on EC2, because we're Amazon Web Services. And that gives us a huge advantage. So Aurora was keeping the open standard, open source interfaces. Your MySQL code runs just fine on Aurora. No changes except changing the endpoint. But because Aurora is only going to run an AWS, it lets us optimize 
and get huge advantages. With Aurora, as noted here, we are able to get 500,000 reads per second, 100,000 writes per second, 64 terabytes in a single database, all on the cloud. We're able to do replication. Today we call it 15-way replication because there's 16 regions, so I can have it in every region. Every time we open a new region, we'll add one to that count because you can have the same data replicated everywhere, all automated, all happening on its own, and of course, you can take advantage of the rest of the ecosystem, such as your stored procedures calling on Lambda. And we have this great high availability. So you've got a, a primary node and up to 15 secondary nodes in one region. And then, of course, I can also have secondary nodes in cross-region. So when a database node fails, it's automatically detected, it's automatically replaced. Uh, processes are detected and recycled. The, end, the clients don't know that this happened. We hide it all under the endpoints. If it's the primary node that, that fails, then very quickly, within, within you know, under a minute, uh, almost always, we're able to switch, o switch that over and promote one of those replicas to primary. So we're able to scale out read traffic across the whole range. So this lets us get to a world where we are reading uh, hundreds of thousands or more per second, really useful in this relational world. Now, Aurora, when we announced it last year, uh, was MySQL. As you may have heard this morning, when you configure Aurora, you now have the choice of using either MySQL or Postgres. So I've got the same Aurora capabilities underneath, but you can choose whether you want to use the MySQL interface or the Postgres interface. It gives us a lot of control and power. So somebody who's gotten a benefit out of this our friends at Pacific Gas and Electric. If you're not familiar with them, they're the main power uh, electric utility in the San Francisco Bay Area. So the big issue they've always had with their databases is when you have an outage, right? It's California. You're going to get wildfires. You're going to get earthquakes. When that happens, you're going to have a lot of things stop working, and you're going to have a lot of angry and scared customers. And you need to know where your technicians are, where your information is, get that information quickly. They often had database outages to go with these power outages. That was not helping, because you get a huge spike. Moving to Aurora, not a problem anymore. Earthquakes are still a problem, but now PG&E can deal with them more quickly and more effectively, because they're able to use uh, Amazon Aurora. And because they're able to do multi-region replication, even if the earthquake does manage to damage, say, our Northern California region, they also have that data in Oregon. They also have the data in Virginia, other places so that we're able to keep running even under high stress. Now, if you didn't start on one of the Amazon databases, how do you get there? So I'm going to do a little plug on the side here for a database migration service. Database migration service makes it super easy to move from a source database onto one of our targets. So here's a few examples of what we can do. This makes it simple to take, say, a MySQL or an Oracle or a Postgres environment and move it into various targets. So this is not a comprehensive list. This is just some of the examples we can do. You can choose to do this as a once and done, or you can choose to do this as a continuous copy or anything in between. So we're making it easy to move that data around and choose the data environment you want it to be. All right. Relational databases are great, but they have some limits. Right? Relational databases grew out of uh, theoretical wor work done in the 1970s that turned into the relational database world that we started seeing in the 80s and became dominant in the 90s, and it's optimized for storage. It's normalized. It scales vertically. Look, there's a table. Okay. So and, as, as defined with rows and columns. It's great for a lot of uses, but not all uses. One of the places where you have a problem is if your schema keeps changing. So let's pretend that you're a huge online retailer that started in books and expanded into other things. And when you're putting a book in your database, then you, have, you need to have information about the title and the author and the publisher. But when you put a tennis shoe into the database, you need a different set of information. And when you put a t-shirt, you need a different set. And when you put a cooking pot, you need a different set. So in the early days of, of, this, uh, of this company, which I'm sure you've all figured out by now is Amazon.com, um, we had a lot of work redoing schemas and changing the tables. So our engineers worked on creating what later become called NoSQL. So we invented the, we wrote what was called the Dynamo paper uh, on what we had developed in order to run our growing retail business. And of course, a few years ago, we made this available to our customers as well. 
So DynamoDB is a non-relational managed NoSQL database service. Well, that was a lot to say. So uh, NoSQL is an analyst term that took off. Today, the marketing people say that actually stands for not only SQL. But whatever it means, it means that I don't have a schema controlling my world, so I can have many different objects of different types stored in the same database, or in the case of Dynamo, in the same table. So it's a schemaless data model. And the great thing about Dynamo is that it, you get the same consistent performance no matter how much data is in it, and there's no limits on how much data you can have. You're almost always going to get a query in four to six milliseconds. If you have a megabyte, four to six milliseconds. If you have a gigabyte, four to six milliseconds. If you have a petabyte, four to six milliseconds. So it gives us a very consistent and reliable speed. And of course, the reason for that is underneath the hood, it's doing partitioning and, and, and splitting that up automatically for you. Um, we scale for you. It's designed to be low cost. And the cost here is modeled on how much data you're moving. So you actually provision how many reads and how many writes per second you want to pay for. So no throughput limit, no storage limit. Now, it's not truly no storage limit. If you say, hey, I want an exabyte in the database, our answer would be, let's talk <laughs> and find if that's really the right way to do it. But we have customers who are using DynamoDB with, uh, with uh, tens of, of terabytes, hundreds of terabytes, and getting up into the petabyte scale. It automatically partitions when either the data set grows or the amount of throughput you need grows. So it's able to actually scale up extremely effectively and invisibly. And of course, it's durable. It is always deployed in three availability zones, unless you're in one of our regions that only has two availability zones, but then it's in two. So you're always writing three times. You don't have to worry about clustering. It's always clustered. So we're able to provide consistent high performance and consistent high availability to these NoSQL relational environments. Now. One of the customers who's doing this that we think is a little bit interesting is Nexon. If you're not familiar with Nexon, they're one of the biggest game developers in the world. They use Dynamo as, a game, as their game database uh, for a number of games. Their big one right now is something called Heroes of Incredible Tales. So if you've ever done gaming, you have no idea to launch if it's going to go like that or if it's going to go this, this one didn't go plop. So uh, Hit went out there. It had uh, 2 million registered users on day one. It currently has uh, somewhere in the range, uh, well, I don't know the exact number, but it's more than 50 times what they had on the first day. So they got a huge number of people playing this. And because it's Dynamo, they didn't have to scale the database. So you don't play the game in the database, but the database is where I'm keeping track of players and IDs. This is a uh, fantasy uh, battle game. So you know what kind of sword you have and how many gold pieces you have and all that other information, as well as doing the matchmaking so you know who you're going to fight. It's actually a mobile game where six people can fight at the same time. And uh, I first learned about this when I was on a trip to Korea, and I noticed everyone else on the subway were fighting each other on their mobile phones. And it was all here. So they typically have about 170,000 concurrent players at once. But because they can scale this, this sca they don't have to scale it on demand. It scales by itself, lets us do some great stuff. Um, they're about to come out with, uh, their, 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 they've uh, announced their next game, which is a, multi, a massive multiplayer role-playing game on a world that involves rockets and dinosaurs called Durango. So we're looking forward to that as they build that out using Dynamo. And ElastiCache. So ElastiCache is magic sauce that makes all databases faster and cheaper. Okay, that's a lie. There's no such thing as magic. There's only code. But this uses two engines. Memcache, Memcache D has been around for quite a long time. It actually first came out of the gaming world with uh, LiveJournal and Zynga. And Redis, which has been around since 2009, but give us options for very high speed in memory key value store. What's high speed? This is why my shirt has the cute uh, thing on it that says milliseconds or, the, or microseconds. I blew the line, wow. Microseconds are the new milliseconds. Our average object to read or write in, in ElastiCache is about 400 microseconds, 0 0.4 milliseconds. That makes it about 10 to 15 times faster than any other option we have. Why is it so fast? It's all in memory. So what's great about all in memory, simple, fast. What's bad about all in memory? You can only hold as much data as you have memory. So today, that limit's pretty good. It's 3.5 terabytes. And with some of the announcements you heard today about R4 nodes and other things, those numbers are going to go up. But again, it's fully managed, no administration. We provide the availability and the reliability. And kind of like Aurora, 
it's a 100% open source interface, but we've put some hardening underneath to make it take advantage of EC2 so that it is indeed ridiculously fast. I, I can say that because it's in the documentation that it's ridiculously fast. But it's also open source. We have persistence, so the data is not stored on disk, but I can take snapshots for backup in order to re recover. And we have a very highly available environment where in each Redis cluster, I can have 15 shards, and each shard can have up to five replicas. So right now on our Elastic Cache cluster, we can handle 4.5 million writes per second and 20 million reads per second. Do you need to write and read data that fast? You will. And even if you don't right now, it's good to know that the ceiling is way above your current needs. So this is a tool that makes it really easy to make databases fast and reliable. You can put this, you can use this as a primary data store, some of our customers do, but most of our customers, as the name Elastic Hash implies, use it as a caching model to increase the speed and reduce the costs of Amazon RDS or DynamoDB or some of our other options. Some of them will use it for other databases on DB2, uh, uh, sorry, on EC2, such as IBM DB2 or MongoDB or other pieces. So one example of that is Expedia, currently the world's largest travel agency. Expedia deployed a number of systems onto uh, DynamoDB, and they were happy with the performance, but they had to provision for the maximum throughput. By putting a caching layer in front of there, we were able to move them from paying 35,000, uh, in this case, writes per write, write units, writes per second, to 3,500. Because by using the caching layer, we could intercept those writes and drip them in at the appropriate level. Because they didn't all have to write immediately. Similar thing on the read side, we've had customers that we can reduce the number of reads they need, uh, read units on Dynamo by 99%, or uh, customers that were needing 20, 30, 40 nodes of database down to five or six by caching those reads. So in the case of Expedia, that's about 200 million messages a day. They come in these big bursts, but we can use the caching layer to slow down where it gets into the database and therefore significantly reduce their costs. In their case, about an 84% reduction in the cost of running their application. Why not 90%? Well, the caching isn't free, but I cut the database cost 90% and there was about 6% in order to do this work. Good trade for Expedia. They were happy with it. Then there's analytics. So Redshift is another way beyond Aurora that we're taking advantage of PostgreSQL technologies. In this case, or using a Postgres-based environment in order to create a really effective system for analytics. Because we looked at this and we saw a lot of our customers are using big, expensive, dedicated hardware to do data warehousing. And we said, well, could we make that a lot faster, a lot simpler, and a lot cheaper? And you know, if you've ever dealt with AWS or the rest of Amazon, that's kind of our whole point of existing as a company. So it's everything from uh, how do we deliver a package faster, simpler, and cheaper, to how do we deliver a data warehouse. It's a relational data warehouse. It puts information in sorted by columns, not by rows, which makes it possible to do huge scans really fast. So usually through large environments, we're scanning at about uh, four gigabytes per second, and then we're able to do that only on the columns that apply to your query. So we've got lots of customers who have put this in here and found, wow, I can have, so we support up to two petabytes and we can scan through that in, 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 in less than an hour. So that gives us the ability to do interesting things, but you don't have to be a big customer to have big data. So we've got lots of you know, internet customers like Yelp with, with petabytes, or big customers like NTT Docomo in Japan. Here's another Japanese company I dealt with. They're not a big company, they're called Sushiro. Sushiro is using Internet of Things, because this is one of those places you have sushi on plates and it goes around a conveyor, and every plate has an IoT in it. So by using Redshift in real time, they know who's buying what sushi, how quickly, and what. They've been able to reduce their food waste by 80% because they know globally who's eating what and what restaurants. So they're a nice chain. They've got about 380 stores across uh, Japan and a few outside. But the inventory and the consumption information has, has let this relatively small company use big data to have big savings and be able to provide better food. The other one I'll mention in the, uh, two others I'll mention in the analytics space. So Elasticsearch service, Elasticsearch is an open source uh, distributed search and analytics engine. About a year ago, we started offering it as a service 
Because like everything else we've been talking about, running databases, you know, running databases isn't hard. Running available databases is hard. But the really hard thing about running databases, as you'll hear from our uh, friends at FanDuel, is how much time and effort you spend running the database. Elasticsearch falls in that category. It's kind of hard to run an Elasticsearch environment. And it's really hard to size search engines. But when you use our service, all you do is go and say, OK, I don't want three nodes. I want five nodes. No outages. It automatically changes for you. Change the instance size. Change it from an M3 medium to a R3 2XL, whatever makes sense. Move it around. But the most common use for this isn't actually a traditional search engine. It's log analytics. Because you can move stuff in. And of course, what generates logs? Everything. So there's built-in patterns here to take your AWS CloudWatch and CloudTrail logs, pull them in for visualization. I'd urge all of you to give this a try, because the pattern to do this is completely built out. If you go to AWS and look for centralized logging, you'll find a full cloud formation that with one click and 20 minutes later, you're visualizing all of your, your logs for AWS. And it's easy to add in logs for almost any other application. So sometimes beyond log analytics, we use it for business like McGraw-Hill. The education group in McGraw-Hill is providing tests and quizzes and information for education across uh, dozens of countries and thousands of jurisdictions. Each month, they have 100 to 150 million learning events. Student took a quiz. A teacher met with a parent. By pulling all of this in and using Elasticsearch, they're able to analyze those results and both prevent dashboards, so a parent knows what their children is doing, a teacher knows what everyone in their class is doing, a headmaster knows what everyone in their school is doing, but also be able to track effectiveness and progress and give people analytics that are useful, and doing all of that through a search engine that allows me to do flexible and efficient searches. So, we're, so logs are not just for operational intelligence, they're also for figuring out what's happening in my whole organization. Before they were using Elasticsearch, there was some really expensive data warehousing stuff going on. Radically cheaper and radically more effective. And the last one I'm going to mention is Amazon EMR. So this is a managed platform uh, with uh, originally around MapReduce, now mostly around Tez, and also Spark and Presto. So this is the whole world of Hadoop technologies, and this is us running Hadoop for you. So again, Hadoop isn't hard to use. It's not that hard to set up. It's hard to keep it running. It's like anything else in databases. To have a high availability, reliable database, there's a 1,000 things you have to get right. And if you get 999 right, it doesn't work. You have to get all 1,000 right. So our customers use this because it's easier to let Amazon get those 1,000 things right. So here I can use uh, S3 or HDFS or MapR as my storage options, leverage elasticity and the security features that we have. And a lot of people use Amazon EMR with spot instances. So when I have a big chunk of analytics and I want to get it done on the next day, but I don't really care about the exact time, I want to get it cheap, I can use this to set up with spot, decide how much I'm willing to pay, and when the availability hits that level, it does the analytics. So one company I'll mention using this is Amgen. Amgen is a major biopharmaceutical company based out of California. And Amgen, what is, whenever they do a product launch, they need to know how is this drug selling, is it working, and how is it going against our internal sales figures versus external sales figures to see if they match up. So they, would, they generally do this about once a month and then more often with their product launches. They used to do this with internal Teradata systems, and it was taking 16 to 24 hours to do the run, plus they had to pay for a really expensive Teradata system, which is a pretty pricey set of equipment. When they moved this onto Amazon EMR, then running on AWS, first of all, it only takes about eight hours now. And uh, in fact, they could do it faster because it's basically a money trade-off. How much am I willing to spend? But I use it eight hours a month. I pay for eight hours a month. So not only do we get the results faster and more flexibly, but they're radically less expensive. Plus, they had a pretty large staff that was dedicated to running the Teradata environment. That staff no longer has to run the environment. That staff can now be working on what is the value to Amgen. Are these drugs doing what they need to do? Are we getting the information we need to have? And that's been very valuable to them. All right, I warned you I would talk quickly. So that was an overview of our relational uh, database service and DynamoDB and uh, ElastiCache and Aurora and Redshift and EMR and Elasticsearch. So let's talk to somebody who's actually made this stuff work in real life, if I can make my clicker work. 
Nope. All right. So you will get no movie. <laughs> so I would like to invite up to the stage Robin Spira from FanDuel. Is this the clicker here? Is that it? Cool. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks, Darren. Um, it's a great privilege to be here today uh, to tell you about our journey with uh, Amazon Managed Database Services. But before we get stuck in, I'm going to give you a quick history of FanDuel's time. Uh, yep. So in 2007, an Englishman, an Irishman, two Welshmen, and a Scotswoman launched an online news prediction game called HubDub. It was a game that attracted a great audience, but it didn't really attract any revenue. So in 2009, at South by Southwest Conference in Texas, the founders gathered in a garden with a group of HubDub users to consider the problem. They knew that sports, particularly American sports, were by far the most popular part of HubDub, and this led to the idea to do a complete pivot of the company. The photograph shows the very session in progress and the moment that FanDuel was born. So FanDuel pioneered Daily Fantasy Sports, or DFS for short, and the pivot turned out to be a great idea, because this time it had a pretty good revenue model. The breakout year was in 2014, and by the end of 2015, we had 6 million registered users. This year, we've seen a dramatic change in the way people interact with FanDuel, and the majority of users now play exclusively using the mobile apps. We've also made it much easier to play socially with friends mode. Now, I know many of you from the US will probably know what DFS is, but here's a quick recap for those who are less familiar, because I know not everyone in here is from the US. As with traditional fantasy sports, Daily Fantasy Sports allows you to create or draft a team made up of players from real life teams, and the fantasy scoring is then based on the events in the real life games. But compared to traditional fantasy sports, where you're committed to a team for an entire season, DFS is more like a one night stand, allowing you to draft a new team every time you play. Every player you pick has an assigned value, and obviously the best players are the most expensive players, so there's quite a skill to drafting a team uh, within the budget. And it's something that our users tell us uh, is the, the, one of the most fun parts of the game. FanDuel originally offered simple winner head to head, uh, winner takes all head to head contests uh, for the NFL. But since then, we've come quite a long way. And we now offer a variety of sports and contest types with our biggest tournaments offering million dollar prize pools. As with any disruptive business, we are always innovating. And this year, we launched Fens Mode, which was designed to combine the social aspects of traditional fantasy sports with a sort of, sort of instant gratification of daily fantasy sports by offering users the chance to play against their friends for cash or bragging rights season long. So while for many, Friends Mode was somewhat revolutionary, in fact, it's actually just a significant step in what's been a constant evolution of the product. When FanDuel launched, there was no template or blueprint for what DFS product should look like, and no one knew how big it would become. What now seems like standard stuff for a DFS product, in the same way that a shopping cart is obvious for an online shop, at the start, these things weren't really obvious at all. What's really important, it, and that's really important because as software engineers, we know it can sometimes be hard to balance moving fast and innovating with brilliant engineering, which is something those of you who are also working for disruptive companies uh, will identify with. Excuse me, I have got a very dry mouth. When you're innovating, you often have to try different things to get traction. And this means technical decisions made for the right reasons based on what you know today will come back to haunt you. We definitely have had our fair share of these. So, it's important that as your company and product evolves, your platform evolves with it. Last year, as part of our platform roadmap, we decided to move our data stores to AWS managed database services for a variety of reasons. Now, it's one thing for me as the CTO to sit there and sign off on such a move, but the real work is carried out by my awesome team, and two of my team members are with me here today to tell you more about it. So with that, I'll hand you over to Alan. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. Yep. Hi, 
Hi there, everyone. Um, so that video that uh, tells our users how they can become sports rich. But before Fangio could become the success that it is today, the business had to um, become what I would term from an engineering perspective to be platform rich. Um, and if I just click onto the slide, that might actually help. There we go. So this slide shows the kind of problem that most businesses would like to have, hockey stick growth. And Fangio has been extremely lucky to experience this phenomenon. But as our brand awareness grew, so did the year-on-year -year growth in terms of active deposits, revenue. And as I run through the journey that our platform has taken, you're going to see a number in the top right-hand corner of each slide. This number represents the approximate growth in our business as measured relative to that first year. The evolution of our platform was very much driven by this business expansion, and we had to evolve to be able to cope the load. At the time, we had so many new users, but we had no idea how fast the platform was going to be able to grow. So in the next half dozen or so slides, what I'm going to do is take you on a journey that views the platform through the lens of business uptime. I'll share some of the data challenges that we encountered along the way, and I'll also talk about the Amazon technology choices that we made and how they helped us stabilize our business. So at the outset, Fangio had founder code running on a LAMP stack in a co-location center, which was pretty much how all these things started back in those days. The stack had a monolithic PHP code base running on top of a monolithic MySQL instance. And that MySQL instance had a schema layout that wasn't optimized for the scale that Fangio was about to experience. So as the business grew, decisions were made that were appropriate at the time to deal with the scale problem at hand. We also realized that we would have to revisit those decisions pretty much on a yearly basis to be able to cope with the next wave of business growth. Some of the problems we had related to legacy code being carried forward without the requisite attention being paid to technical debt reduction, and the software itself didn't scale very easily. So there was a heavy reliance on the monolithic database server at the back end to, to meet the, business, the demands of the business scale. Operationally, this meant that the database server was running hot pretty much most NFL Sundays, and on any given NFL Sunday as we approached game lock, that server would run at 90% plus of its compute capacity. And in so much as the software didn't easily scale, we also had a problem with co-location. With co-location itself, with physical hardware, it echoes the first syllable. It's just hard to scale with physical co-location. And so the not so unusual takeaway from this slide is that scaling was a real problem for the business. So moving forward to 2010, Fangio realized the need to scale, and it was this year that we made an, an initial foray into cloud computing. Back in 2010, it wasn't clear that Amazon was the, going to be the leader in cloud technology that it is today, so we were with a different provider at that time. We chose that provider based on price, but we experienced uh, some pretty hairy operational issues with them, particularly in relation to networking. It was these early issues, coupled with some pretty mediocre support, that would force us to move lock, stock, and barrel to Amazon the following year. However, that initial foray into cloud computing gave us the impetus to move our platform to more, more towards a cloud-based model for hosting. In doing so, we let go of the pain points that we would normally have with terrestrial hosting, but we acquired a whole new bunch of growing pains in the process. So in 2010, we made several significant platform changes. The application was refactored to a degree in order to enable the web server layer to scale horizontally. But despite our best endeavors to scale, we still had that monolithic throbbing database at the back end. Moving forward to 2011, this was the year that FanDuel migrated lock, stock, and barrel to Amazon Web Services. Moving to AWS was simply the best move that FanDuel ever made. Did you put that in here? I, I, I edited it. Yeah, I'll take that here. Yeah. Thank you very much. I so got you, that you here. You said Amazon was great. So, so there we go. Thank you. <laughs> Do that at once. But moving to AWS didn't magically solve the scaling problems that we had. The site still went down frequently on NFL Sundays. And I have a slide coming up that will show you the traffic shape that we had to contend with. This will help put into context the difficulty of the scaling problem that we actually had to solve. So the initial database setup we had with Amazon was self-installed MySQL running on self-managed EC2 with statement-based replication. We were extremely fortunate at this time in that our code base had a relatively clean separation of read and write functionality. Depending on which request was coming in from what endpoint, we could either route it to the master or to the appropriate read replica. This uh, gave us a higher degree of scalability for any read-heavy workload that we had. And not having to deal with the separation of the read and write concerns at that time 
allowed us to focus on other endeavors that would help mitigate the technical debt that we had in our data layer. There were drawbacks to this uh, new self-managed setup. The addition of each new read replica would place ever more burden on the master, forcing it to spend more of its compute capacity keeping the replicas in sync. Data loss was another concern. If we lost the master, then we lost whatever replication data was in flight. And adding a read replica to the cluster was a long, drawn-out process. EC2s had to be lovingly curated by hand. This involved OS configuration, MySQL installation and configuration, seeding it with the data, warming up the query cache, warming up the buffer pool, and so on and so forth. And all of these activities were crucial before that replica could become online. On reflection, we were doing all of that heavy lifting that Amazon does for us today. However, one thing was true in 2011, and that was our data layer capability had moved on significantly. In 2012, work started in earnest to carve chunks off the application monolith and move the platform more towards a service-oriented architecture. Discrete back-end Java service components were created, each with their own backing store, and application components were decoupled with the introduction of message queues. And for better or for worse, we also started to look at Redis as a persistence option. After all, Twitter were using it at the time, so it had to be pretty cool, right? We identified Puppet as the tool of choice in order to button things down in terms of configuration management. And if the clicker works, there we go. And consideration was given on how we would elasticize all the things, right? So we started looking at ELBs and considering how to build stateless application layers that could horizontally scale. Up to, the point, up to this point in time, rather, our uh, infrastructure of elasticity had been managed by a homegrown Perl script. And whilst noble in its aim, this script was very occasionally unreliable. My colleague Steve, who'll speak shortly, will give you a little bit more detail on that if you buy him a beer afterwards. So with auto-scaling groups maturing as a capability within AWS, we started to use them to manage our scaling needs. Almost immediately, we benefited from better fault tolerance, service availability, and cost management. But we still had that huge legacy database at the end. The master was running on one of Amazon's biggest EC2s at the time, and it was running pretty hot still on NFL Sundays. We were continually asking Amazon for more and more IOPS, reaching a provisioning peak of over 8,000 at one stage. By 2013, business volumes had now really increased 625x, and we had new platform challenges. We had time pressure to get an IOS app to market, and that de um, desire largely shaped the initial development path of what would be our new REST-based API layer. Little consideration was given at the outset of this journey as to how that new mobile app would be furnished with the right data. Um, <clears throat> we continued to carve parts of the application monolith to implement them as Java backend services. But then what happened? Boom. We had the great NFL blackout. We went down on the opening day of the 2013 NFL season, but we weren't alone. I think pretty much all the other DFS providers went down at the same time. The monolithic database had suffered a cascade failure caused by the killer combination of a schema that wasn't optimized for scale and a high number of write queries in the lead up to game lock. This caused ever higher levels of contention as the number of table locks increased, eventually leading to the demise of the database. So the focus no naturally turned to improve our DR position. So we migrated from a single master to an active passive multi-master setup with each master having its own replication chain. This gave us higher availability, but it still fell short of what was possible. It was still possible to lose replication data in flight to the passive master. But in reality, with this setup, we never actually had to fail over. But it did give us the added advantage of being able to make database changes to the secondary and then flip that over to be the primary. For backup provision, we would take a read replica offline, snapshot its data volumes, which contained the DB files, bring it back into the cluster and let it catch up with replication. And this was done on an hourly basis, but introduced you know, a load of operational complexity. And whilst we managed the, is this gonna work here? There we go. Whilst we managed the rest of the NFL season without any service degradations, we still had that pesky monolithic database at the back end. By 2014, business volumes had taken another giant leap. But we did manage to make it through that NFL season without what was left of our monolithic database causing us any further outages, and this was progress. We launched our core internal API and started to replatform our front-end web uh, components to be able to use it, and we also launched our award-winning iOS mobile app the same year. But 2014 wasn't all plain sailing. In the second week, we endured a service degradation, this time with one of our uh, Redis components at the back end. 
one of the Redis read replicas had fallen so far behind its master, possibly due to a network partition, that it made a full dump request to the master to be reseeded. Uh, and unfortunately, this situation persisted with no step off in frequency of occurrence. So we ended up th with the master's compute bandwidth being totally saturated and annihilating the service. What I'm trying to point out here is that there's an error prone nature of trying to self manage a Redis cluster. And whilst it's fast, Redis does have some operational drawbacks if you run it in a single instance. It's single threaded and its performance is vertically limited by CPU clock speed. But still, at the end of 2014, we had that monolithic database. Wind forward to last year. As most of our US audience members will be aware, the main DF industry protagonists ran enormous user acquisition campaigns during 2015. There was a DFS ad on TV every four or five ads. It'd be DFS ad, automobile ad, pharmaceutical ad, DFS ad, and so the cycle would continue. This drove business volumes up by another order of magnitude. And in 2015 alone, we ended up paying out over $2 billion in winnings to our users. Just to be clear, that's billion with a B. 2015 also saw the formation of a dedicated architecture function. And from an infrastructure perspective, we had widespread adoption of infrastructure as code using cloud formation, all provisioned using Sparkle formation. The platform continued to add more Java backend service components with their own specific data stores. And crucially for the data layer, we migrated our monolithic database from a self-hosted multi-master setup to an identical setup on Amazon RDS for MySQL. Moving to RDS for MySQL took away a lot of pain points for us. Backup management and replication management became Amazon's problems overnight. Before our RDS, it would take one to two DevOps colleagues most of a day to create a read replica, provision the EC2, configure MySQL, manually copy the data, warm the query cache, and so on and so forth. As I mentioned before, this was time consuming and a fidgety task. And configuring and swapping out a master was a whole different ballgame. RDS for MySQL took these pain points away for us pretty much overnight. This is where we really got to appreciate the value of, of Amazon doing that undifferentiated heavy lifting for us. So where are we now in 2016, halfway through the NFL season? Well, platform is pretty stable, touch wood. Our recovery point in time objectives are significantly lower than they have been in previous years, and service interruptions are now mercifully rare. One of the keys to that has been our performance testing uh, capability, which is now rock solid. And one of the things we focus on with that is what we call broad endpoint testing. This is the uh, ability of being able to test all platform con components simultaneously, you know, redlining those components and figuring out where the operational bottlenecks might be found. As a result, our platform now has significant operational headroom, which is truly amazing. And as, as I've touched on along the way, we focused uh, a lot in this year on reducing the tech debt we had in our platform. We untied those application Gordian knots by taking a kind of slice at a time approach. And architecturally, we have now predominantly service-oriented architecture. And getting this breathing space has allowed us to shift our focus to the adoption of more ar modern architectural paradigms. Yes, we still have that monolithic uh, database. Yes, it can still be a provisioning uh, thorn in our operational side, but our dependency on it is a lot less than it once was. At this point, some of you might be wondering why we didn't consider using DynamoDB to address some of our scaling needs. The answer to that question is that we did consider it, but it just wasn't fit for our use case. Now, this slide won't be easy to make out, but I wanted to show it to you anyway, one of those unreadable slides that you always have to show. But it's just to give you a feel for the service-oriented architecture that I've been talking about. At the top there, you can see the clients, which uh, will be the iOS app, the Android app, and web. And there's the service layers there and the data layers just below that. Whoops, there we go. So at this point, I'd like to pause to recap some of our data challenges. The prevailing operational model for most businesses is that if their service fails, they fix that problem as soon as possible, whereupon their users can come back and retry the transaction that failed before. Um, E-commerce providers, for example. Fangio's model is somewhat inverted to this. If we fail at the wrong time, then there is literally no opportunity for the users to come back to retry their transaction. Our pre-game lock entry and edit traffic is seasonal and for the most part predictable, and it follows real sporting fixtures. We have absolute times that we cannot miss, such as game start. This means that our platform has to be appropriately scaled in advance of game start, usually in the three hours leading up to game start. Very few businesses have to cope with a traffic shape where everything is near to zero, 
it's, then it becomes go, 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 and then we have to be complete. All that entry and edit transactions must be complete prior to game start. We have no business failure safety net whatsoever. Any failure at this time would place a colossal burden on our customer services team, refunding users and so on, not to mention the intangible cost of reputational damage. I think at one point we did ask the NFL if they would be prepared to pause game start for us if we experienced any data consistency issues, but so far they've failed to get back to us on that one. So entry and edit. As I mentioned in the last slide, we have a hard stop at game start. We're taking people's money in return for an entry that, that has a nominal value, and the sums of money involved are substantial. Atomicity is extremely important. We are performing atomic distributed transactions whose integrity is paramount. And availability, whilst important, is the only cap compromise we can make in return for safeguarding that data consistency. At our peak in 2015, we processed around 1,000 inserts and 200 updates per second. Now, this doesn't sound like a lot, but remember this was against a database whose schema wasn't optimized for scale. To give you an example, we had some core tables with overburdening numbers of indexes to enable out-of-band business reporting. Uh, one table in particular that we had had over 600 million rows and 14 indexes. So any write operation against that table was extremely computationally expensive. Super Bowl 51 is in Houston this year. Um, well, at the peak that I've been talking about from last year, we processed transactions at a rate that would fill out the Reliance Stadium in less than six minutes. But whilst, whilst we can cope with the volume of traffic that we've talked about today, you've seen that this journey hasn't been easy. Replication lag would still be a problem with data rights still pending at game start. And at one point, we had an issue where users were able to see another user's lineup changing after game start. Only a page refresh would bring everything back into line. This was caused by our live scoring service reading data from a read replica that had yet to be updated from the master. Those users thought they were seeing an ability being granted to other users to be able to edit their lineups after game lock. And this is a situation that we ended up having to compensate some users for. In general, we kept the replication lag down to under 30 seconds. And to obviate any operational concerns, we introduced a grace period between game lock and game start, sufficiently long enough to make sure that all transactions had been flushed through before live scoring came into effect. Now, I've got some graphs in the next couple of slides here that will hopefully provide a little bit more context. The x-axis on this graph shows GMT on any given NFL Sunday, and the y-axis is the number of modifications per second. So the magenta line you see is the number of lineups being modified, and the turquoise line above that is the number of entries. Entries is the higher line here because most people who create lineups tend to enter those more than once into different contests. The main spike you see is 1 p.m. Eastern. That's when all the NFL games start. And the smaller spikes to the right represent the same kind of activity in other sporting fixtures like baseball or basketball. Live scoring. So fundamentally, FanDuel has two insanely high peaks of data traffic to deal with. And a smooth transition between the two is essential. We must have a consistent view of the data. So immediately after our biggest hurdle of entry and edit data consistency, we have our next biggest hurdle, and that's live scoring. That sharp drop-off you saw on the last slide is matched by an equally sharp climb that represents the data aggregation and provisioning to underpin our live scoring experience. You'll see this climb on the next slide. Initially, live scoring was treated as an optional extra for, for us, but we quickly realized that users saw it as a major attraction for post-game lock. To provide a little context, when Peyton Manning throws a 30-yard touchdown pass, that event is recorded at the stadium, like other events, is available for FanDuel to consume electronically within about 15 seconds. We take that data, we process it, we pump it back down to the devices, mobile devices, and web. And that near real-time client update capability has caused a genuinely, genuinely exciting two-screen two experience for our users. They watch the TV, they see their guy do well, they look at their phones about 30 seconds later and they see that update reflected as their avatar moves to a more, a more positive place. Now, live scoring has two ma major scalability concerns. At the back end, uh, we have to ingest all those events and update huge data structures and store them in our backing store, which is uh, Redis in this particular case. And then we have the front end concern where we pump all that data down to, to the user devices. The total time from field event to uh, client being updated can vary from tens of seconds to a minute. So the x-axis in this graph, again, GMT on any given NFL Sunday, and the y-axis here showing the number of contests that have been scored per second. So this is the climb that I was talking about just a moment ago. 
What you're seeing here is a peak of about 3,000 user contests being scored per second. Uh, you know, this is a huge exercise in data aggregation and is extremely computationally uh, ex intense. The spikiness is driven by the number of real-time events that uh, come, into the, come into the system. And to give you a feel for that ingestion rate, if you think of all the NFL fields that there are around the country, people throwing the ball, catching the ball, rushing, whatever the different terms are, you have to excuse me, I'm from the UK, not terribly familiar with those. But we ingest all those events, and then we update these data structures. It's pretty, it's pretty full on. The next graph here, the scoring views per second. Again, uh, GMT on any given NFL Sunday. You see the steady growth on the left-hand side of the graph. That is in direct proportion to the number of entries that we're seeing. The reason for that is because once the user has entered the contest, the next uh, part of their user experience is, is the live scoring page. But at that point in time, live scoring isn't running. But then come uh, 1 p.m. Eastern, boom, that number goes up like a rocket. Now, after uh, entry and edit and live scoring, we get the next part of our challenging data life cycle, which is that of settlement. Settlement is the process that happens when all the games in a slate of fixtures are complete. It involves totaling up the scores and then paying out real money. That's that kind of two billion figure that I was talking about earlier. To put some context around this, settling one slate of fixtures alone can involve as, men as many as 10 million reads from and 55 million writes to that monolithic database and we have a limited time window within, settlement must, within which settlement must complete. In terms of performance, they've got a before and after here. On self-managed EC2 running MySQL, uh, we got about five hours for settling one slate of fixtures, and by the time we'd taken settlement and made that into a distinct uh, Java backend service component with its own RDS backing store, we managed to cut that down to about one hour, 20 minutes. So what do we learn on this you know, bumpy journey of managing our own data? Well, our number one concern is data consistency. And aside from scaling, replication lag has hurt us in a number of areas. I talked earlier about the grace period we had to insert. But at another stage, we hedged against replication lag by inserting an artificial time delay between the point where a user's entry was taken and that next step in their experience, the ability to view the lineup they just entered. This was clearly an agricultural solution to a problem that we just simply shouldn't have had. Prior to using any AWS managed database services, the DevOps team had to carry the significant burden in relation to the preparation of read replicas and the maintenance of the self-managed database clusters. Uh, for example, failure and recovery. We were constantly trying to get our RPO and RTO numbers down as close to zero as possible, and management of the active passive multi-master setup was pretty non-trivial. I talked earlier about having to handcraft new read replicas, and all of these work items were done by hand. And of course, what's more is they took a lot of time and effort to perform. The first step we took was to, <clears throat> with Amazon Managed Database Services was to migrate our monolithic database from self-managed uh, multi-master to RDS for MySQL. We couldn't go straight to Aurora at the time because the migration tools, well, Aurora itself is still in beta, but the migration tools for that were not quite as mature as they are now. I've hinted at the advantages that we got along the way, but almost immediately we started to reap the benefits of not having to do any of that hard work I talked about on the last slide. All those pain points, pretty much gone. Automated failover, wow. No more time-consuming manual and error-prone intervention. Our RPO and RTO numbers improved, and we got a uniform interface and ways to interact with our databases. Backups were now Amazon's problem. And our rep lag problem, whilst reduced, wasn't yet eliminated with the move to RDS. That, that happy day was still to come. And my colleague Steve who was heavily involved in some of these migrations. He's going to share very shortly with you some of his experiences. The second step in our journey with AWS Managed Database Services was the move to Aurora. We recognized that Aurora could potentially bring a lot of benefits for our platform. And so when the beta was released, we jumped aboard straight away and started smoke testing. <clears throat> we found a handful of minor teething issues with Aurora. Initially, the, the data import was uh, a little bit on the slow side, and we found an odd edge case where there was a network MTU mismatch between Aurora and EC2 instances. But these issues were all pretty minor in nature, and they were all fixed by Amazon very, very quickly, and we were able to get on with things. So for our first Aurora use case, we picked an internal service, which is known to us as the action log. Basically, basically it is an append-only log. This is... Uh, Rarely read from, <clears throat> excuse me, rarely read from, but is uh, written too heavily by a lot of platform components. And for us, this was a simple and concise performance test case for Aurora. Excuse me. 
Data consistency is the key for the action log because this service is used by our customer service team to address any user uh, complaints that we might have. For example, why did my line off edits not go through or why did my entry not go into this contest? But this initial uh, migration was successful and it gave us the, co the confidence to make Aurora the backing store of choice for not only our monolithic database but also for our Java backend service components. Boom. Come on, you can do it. There we go. So in terms of the benefit we got from Aurora, the biggest one had to be read after write consistency. Reads from replicas uh, were uh, immediately see the data that was committed on the master, and replication lag therefore ceased to become a problem for us, and this was absolutely huge, another notch in our RPO. And in the switch to Aurora, we definitely got a decent performance boost for many of our relational backing stores, and even for our monolithic database with that less than optimal schema layout. All in all, I would say that our Aurora experience has been extremely positive. This presentation is focused largely on our relational databases, but I wanted to share one slide that covered our experience with Redis. You've heard earlier about a live scoring service being backed by Redis, but we also use Redis for a number of our cache-based service components, weather cache, player's cache, user auth tokens, global session, and so on. Up until 2015, these were all self-managed on EC2 in pretty much the same way that we started out with our relational backing stores. All the same pain points we had in terms of management, we had the same pain points with these as well. We actually had one Redis back component uh, that we moved from Redis to Aurora. That sounds kind of strange, but initially when that component was put there, the speed benefits we got from Redis were greatly offset by the work we had to do in the application layer uh, to keep the data consistent. And very much like the uh, operational scenario, can go here in a second. Uh, the benefits were pretty much the same when we uh, moved from self-hosted on EC2 to Elasticash. Uh, we improved the uh, management of the, uh, the clusters, we improved our RPO, RTO numbers, and we, the master failed over time. It was automated and it was a, a heck of a lot quicker. And my colleague Steve, before we had the term undifferentiated heavy lifting, he's done a lot of that himself. So I feel like your, your bicep, Steve, ought to be as big as Arnold Schwarzenegger here. So I'm going to hand over to Steve. He'll give you a, a tiny bit of experience of what he had to endure. Thanks, buddy. Thanks, Alan. So I realize there's a pub crawl and uh, a couple of after parties to get to, so I'll, I've got a fairly short story to go through, if this clicker works. So I'm going to talk about migrations, and we've run a lot of these over the last uh, couple of years, um, particularly in these 2011, 2012, 2013, 2014, from EC2 to uh, RDS and to Aurora. Um, and so I'll talk through some of the, some of the quite quickly, the, short, the, uh, the processes we've taken to go through that. Um, so our customers are up at all times of the day and night. So a lot of our steps here had to focus very heavily on uptime. Uh, we also process a lot of transactions, a lot, a lot of user actions, entries, edits, cash deposits, and withdrawals, with every committed transaction being sacred. So we, get to, we have to go to great lengths to make sure we don't lose a single transaction. Uh, where are we? In RDS, you don't get access to the underlying file system. So you can create snapshots within AWS and use those to spin up copies in RDF itself, but you don't get to ship the actual files on disk around. Uh, so for migrating to and from MySQL, we used tools like MySQL Dump and the Pocono Toolkit, and we, we've become very familiar with those over the years. As Alan mentioned earlier, our first production system to make its way to Aurora was the action log. This database is over a few terabytes in size with a couple of billion rows. So taking the dump from the source database took around eight hours. And when we had that file, loading it into Aurora took another few days. I've called out uh, the master data flag here in the MySQL dump command. Um, since in the time between dumping the data out and dumping the data, into the target database. We'll have to run through millions of transactions, and in any case, need to start replication from the correct spot for consistency. Uh, at that point, we need to set up replication. In RDS, you don't get root access, as I said. Instead, your admin user can run a bunch of AWS managed store procedures that let you do things like set the replication master and start and stop replication. 
So at this point, we use these log coordinates that we collected earlier to make sure that the target database is collected, is carrying on from the correct log position, and very critically, that we're not losing any data. This uh, sort of things like catching up the replication can take a few days again, so we've sort of taken a few days to copy all the data in, and then we've got actually waiting another couple of days with all those millions of transactions in the meantime to catch up. Um, in every change we make to the platform, rollback is very important. Excuse me. I've put a consistency, to, so yeah, I've put a consistency check at this stage of the process, but in reality, we smoke test and review each other's code throughout every process we do. We, we, we run code review, and we, um, as losing data or losing uptime are painful at the best of times, and even worse if we've inflicted it upon ourselves. Depending on the schema, a consistency check once the data dump and replication are set up would most likely cover checking table sizes match and checking the schema matches. Depending on the use case, we may want to build out a little more architecture on the right-hand side. We may want to add more replicas or even change the instance type size. And at this point, we can do this. So we've in fact, we've got this target that we can change at will. Uh, and we've not impacted production traffic because we have this multi-master setup that's, that allows us to change the sort of right-hand side of this diagram without impacting the left. And yeah, I told you the story would be quick. So in fact, we've, we've got this sort of, we've, we've created a very safe architecture. We've got multi-master. And at this point, we can choose to demote the old master in a typical multi-master fashion. We can demote the old, the left-hand side, and promote the new master. In our particular case, we do that with uh, changing DNS entries, or you might be able to do this through changing config or updating your um, service discovery mechanisms or load balances. Now, <laughs> after saying all of that, along uh, DMS, uh, Darren touched on this earlier. Um, in typical Amazon fashion, they like to produce tools pretty much straight after we've uh, solved all the heavy lifting ourselves. Um, it, you know, it, it sort of looks simple on a slide, but we've done this, we've done this process many times. And you know, we, DMS came out six months ago, and at that point, we'd migrated literally everything to Aurora. And so we, we, there's this service out there that I suggest you look into. <laughs> I don't know too much about it, but Darren probably does. And I know there's a talk on it tomorrow. And I told you my slide would be quick. So thanks. And I'll hand back over to Alan. <laughs> Good job. Yeah. Thank you, Steve. Uh, just before I hand back to Darren, I'd like to use this last slide, which I think will be here. Oh, there's that $5. I mustn't forget that. Handy in the bar later. <laughs> so um, before I hand back to Darren, I'd like to use this last slide just to summarize the benefits that the Fangio platform currently enjoys. One more time. Automated failover. Automated failover is no longer complex. Amazon has really taken away a lot of pain for us in this particular area. Um, I think, as Darren touched on earlier, for Aurora, there's a very fast transition time from pr promoting a read replica to a master, usually less than 60 seconds on average. One more time, manage backups. Manage backups, again, this is another big win when viewed through, through the lens of disaster recoverability. And to elim eliminate that most non-deterministic of data headaches, replication lag, that has been absolutely huge for our business, and Aurora has really helped us out there. All of our relational data stores now have the same interfaces and uh, ways of working with them, so simplicity there is good. And when you consider the, uh, the alternative of self-managed solutions, there is a clear uh, cost and operational benefit in the managed services approach. All in all, the Fangio data layer is in a much better place than it was at the outset. And Amazon are really solved a lot of hard problems for us here that we got pretty much sick and tired of trying to manage ourselves. And in all of this, let's not forget Redshift. Uh, I've majored today on the operational aspects of FanDuel, but we also ingest and process a huge amount of analytic data. And the natural choice for us in that space has been Redshift. And I'd like to point out that the same pain points we had in the analytics space were greatly reduced and resolved just as equally when we made the move to Redshift. And finally, Rob and Steve and I are here uh, representing FanDuel's engineering team back home in Scotland. And none of this work I've talked about today would have been possible without having worked with this great team of individuals. They really are an awesome bunch. 
So thank you for bearing with me. I know it's the end of the day. I'm grateful to you for your time. I hope you found some of this material useful. And I'll hand back to you, Darren. So, you've now heard about the range of what we're doing. Now, as you heard Andy Jassy say this morning, we're just getting started. There's a lot coming in the future, but right now, we have what's there to let our customers understand how to run a managed database and for us to do the heavy lifting and the confusing stuff for you. So let's hear it again for our friends at FanDuel and get out there and manage some databases.